Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Archie edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today is January 26th, 2018. Okay, we have not had George on for a little while because you've been ill, you've been busy. You run a full-time church and uh, a growing church, but you showed up in your Archie sweater. Is Betty and Veronica around? What's going on? I have been so sick, Kevin. Uh, you don't want to know how sick I've been. I've been, I've been bad, and and the latest is that the antibi—they, I've been on antibiotics for two weeks now. And the first week it didn't work, and so a few days ago they put me on a second about stuff that was so powerful that uh, it's cleaned out everything in my system. And yesterday it also gave me hives. Oh, gee. So yeah. I am tomato red from top to bottom. I've not been under sun lamp. And anything that touches my skin causes me intense irritation. So I have got loose, baggy, soft clothing on, and uh, <laughs> hopefully I'm not going to die before the end of this show. Well, if you listen closely in the background, every four or five minutes you can hear a... <coughs> <coughs> That's my dear wife. She's downstairs, and she has the flu. In fact, she got her blood test back, and she found out that she has both flu A and B this year. And uh, she was telling the doctor, I still don't feel good after a whole week. And she said, the doctor said, you're not. It's going to be a while. So uh, keep uh, George and Jill in your prayers as we... Uh, I think, Kevin, that's a wonderful achievement to have both yeah, types of flu. Not everybody is so blessed or fortunate. I know. I don't know if they give awards out. I don't know how you get both flus, but uh, uh, dear Jill has both. And uh, it, it's been an interesting week around here as she's uh, had to take the whole week off of work and uh, been sleeping and coughing. But uh, they, they got her uh, some good prescription cough medicine and uh, she'll do better. But uh, do keep her in your prayers. Uh, we haven't talked about news in a long time. And uh, so I had to write down the three or four things we were going to talk about. There have been elections of archbishops um, within the communion, and we're going to cover the Rwanda and Sudan ones. Uh, tell me about the new guy in Rwanda. Uh, Laurent Mabanda, I believe is his name. Mm -hmm. I may have mangled that, but uh, he is very he was very close to uh, uh, Archbishop Raja, his predecessor. This is good news for Pair USA. It's good news for ACNA. Good news for Gafcon. Mm -hmm. This is a fellow warrior in the fight. Honest, intelligent, educated in the West, partially, uh, with some business background and experience. This is somebody who is will be an asset to the international Anglican movement as well as to the Church of Rwanda. So, excellent choice there. Well, the Rwandans were fortunate. Um, they have had such a horrendous history as a country and as a church that in the past generation of bishops, they've actually gone out of their way to make sure we just don't have more of the same old duds and crooks and things that you find in the Episcopal Church. No, no, I, I, I've so been very impressed. Rwandan, so the, the Rwandan bishops are cut above most African bishops mm -hmm. in terms of character, in terms of life experience, in terms of... Uh, spiritual maturity it's a good church it's a good place for them right now that's a dirt poor country and it probably would qualify as one of donald trump's assholes but nonetheless they are good people in rwanda and uh, they're in the anglican church Absolutely. and you know my church is connected to rwanda in fact i i'm under a pair usa uh, uh jurisdiction it's uh interesting to see the growth of Facebook and social media and uh, some of the uh, uh, bloggers and uh, famous people on Facebook have discovered that some of the African priests they know are not fully uh, theologically based in their teachings and some have Joe Olstein type uh, messages they put up and I was watching with frustration as uh, uh, people like Matthew Kennedy and others are are trying to convey the full gospel uh, to some of these people in, in African and Asian countries. And um, I think that's one of the special things Facebook gives us is the ability to uh, see what people believe and help correct what they believe. It's, it's difficult for many Americans mm -hmm. to understand the African and the Asian context. And this whole Donald Trump controversy is a wonderful example. Kevin, you and I have been to many of these places, mm -hmm. and when you go to 
Dar es Salaam, when you go to Nairobi, when you go to Lagos, you smell two things, human excrement and wood smoke. Mm -hmm. um, they are unpleasant people. I've been to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. There are no sewers in Haiti. Well, you people, said people. I think you meant places, unpleasant places. Unpleasant places, excuse yeah, me. That's right. There are, these are unpleasant places, and the governments are corrupt. And in many places, such as Tanzania and India, the churches reflect the government's corruption. And the wide-eyed, starry nature that many Anglicans had when the Africans came to rescue them in the beginning of the crises with the Episcopal Church has given way to some more realism because some of these guys have turned out to be crooks. We were, you know, uh, I, I had a small minor news item, a Tanzanian bishop uh, removed by the Church of Tanzania uh, and uh, an American uh, friend of his who had been sending money for years said, oh, isn't this terrible? He tells me that the Freemasons are out to get him. And it was really hard for me to say, well, no, this guy's a crook. That's correct. He's been pocketing his priest's salary for years. And finally, the church has just gotten around it because he's too crooked. He's, he's not sharing the money with the other bishops. So this is a hard thing to say, Kevin. But, and we're seeing it in a rise now in Kenya. Kenya had a history of corruption among the bishops. And Eliud Wabakula and Benjamin Nzimbi and David Katari spent 20 years cleaning house. Well, the new archbishop is not as strong position as the others, and you're seeing corruption creep back in. So that the last national elections, there were a number of bishops who were given cars and money cash by each of the political parties to round up their parishioners to vote for the party. Yeah. And that's how it starts, uh, church for sale. So, I, I don't mean to paint a universally glim picture because you need then to qualify it against people like the Ugandans and the Rwandans and other churches that have, you know, really made, you know, one of the giants of the Christian faith uh, has, uh, it's like Peter, uh, Peter Akinola and Henry Rombi. These men are men of integrity and character, but not every African bishop is like that. Or American, or European, or Asian. It's uh, the reality on the ground. I remember the wake-up call I got when I was flying. Uh, I don't remember the airline, but we landed in Dar es Salaam for the primates meeting, and I got my bag, I found my tripod, I got everything together, and was going to take a, a taxi out uh, to the White Sands Hotel. And I find a guy who's willing to throw all my stuff in this minivan, a Toyota minivan, with no slide doors at all. And as we're driving out to the, the street, he stops and he paid two people, well, I don't know the, the, the amount of money, but he had to bribe his way out of the airport parking lot. And when we came back in, you know, I had a different driver and I didn't know what was going on. I said, is this the fee? He said, no, this is the bribe. And the guy I paid the bribe to was the guy uh, who was willing to pay the first guy there the, that morning the most money. So he would leave and he could take the bribes. And the level of corruption uh, within uh, many communities in uh, Africa and Asia is just uh, amazing. Uh, we and did, you know. Corruption in the church, you see this uh, in Tanzania, for example. Um, they don't have the sense of uh, individual autonomy and the free market system that we just consider to be normal as in the United States. Um, what Sometimes people ask the question, why are all the shopkeepers in these towns and countries Asians or from other parts of Africa and the reason is is that in Africa the sense of family is so strong that if you have a cousin or a relative and you own a shop and he needs something he can walk in and take it mm -hmm. and that's just how it works and so the uh, a man who becomes a bishop is his tribe and his family expect him to take care of his family that means giving jobs to his family members. That means the money that flows into the diocese is used to support his extended family. So when we're talking about corruption, there's not a lot of pre, not a lot of African bishops are driving Mercedes around town. What they're doing is spreading the money out amongst their families, extended families and client bases, because that's just how their systems work. And it's taken a great will. It's taken the East African revival in parts to break that. 
of uh, seeing all men and women as brothers and sisters in Christ, not as Kikuyu or Maasai or this or that. Now, corruption is not the only foe that Africans face. Uh, right now, there is a, a vast dynamic with the influence of Islam and Islam coming into countries, so much so that it's broken up countries. A great example is Sudan, who also had an election this, this uh, week. Yes, there was an election for an archbishop to uh, replace Archbishop Daniel Deng. Archbishop uh, Justin Barati, uh, he has a second last name, I forget what it is, so we'll just say Archbishop Justin. That's good enough. <laughs> As the Dark Horse, there were four candidates, yeah. but the favorite was Abraham Yel Now, uh, Y-E-L, N-H-I-A-L, whatever, Abraham and Justin were the favorites. Uh, Abraham was the favorite, and two people... The other two candidates threw their support behind Abraham, but Justin won by one vote. Now, about 20 years ago, they had a disputed archiepiscopal election when Benjamina Yogasuk was elected archbishop. The losing faction refused to accept this, and there was a schism for a few years in the Episcopal Church of Sudan, which George Carey's resolved by making everybody a bishop, both sides. This time around, the Abraham did not contest the election, and he's pledged his unity and support for the new archbishop. Uh, uh, archbishop is the new archbishop, Justin, is tied to the Diocese of Albany, tied to the Diocese of Down and Dremore bishops Bill Love and Harold Miller. So he is certainly going to continue the policies of his predecessor uh, as concerns GAFCON, but at the same time, he probably has more of an affinity to what we would call the Global South, okay. the uh, uh, Munir and Nice group, who don't review, who don't see all Episcopalians as being the Antichrist. That they're fittedly few, but some good Episcopalian bishops still left. I, I have to agree with you on that. Uh, um, definitely, Sudan will be a supporter of GAFCON, but like you said, uh, I, the prevailing choice would be uh, the Global South type uh, ideology. Um, let's talk a little bit about our plans. Uh, we have started raising money to go to GAFCON. Um, we've got, I think, the uh, last couple weeks, a couple hundred dollars in donations. Want to thank you. Uh, but, George, I'm going to pause a little bit because we want to get some more information uh, about. Uh, where to stay in, uh, in GAFCON, whether it's worth sending three people. Um, if there's one thing I've ever been, it's fair to the donators of our show. I don't want people who are raising money and sending money to us to ever feel like we're wasting money. Uh, we have a couple events that are big. Uh, obviously, the uh, convention down in Austin, Texas for the Episcopal Church and GAFCON. Before I send one person to the general convention or uh, three people to GAFCON, I want to be sure it's valuable and worth it. This is uh, 2018. A lot of these things can be live streamed, uh, and so much so the press doesn't always want to need to be there. Uh, the last uh, general convention is a perfect example. How many press were down there? Half dozen. I was the Washington Post correspondent to yeah. that convention, uh, and there were. Diocesan newspaper reporters, some church report newspapers reporters, and then the stringers, the AP would show up one day. Uh, they'd show it up for the election of the new presiding bishop. So we have to ask ourselves, what's going to happen at the general convention in Austin that's worth investing $2,000, $3,000? In other words, is there, is it going to be a same old, same old? Uh, in other words, you, I can go there and I can keep people titillated with the latest craziness. Uh, as to sort of the asinine things that General Convention gets up to. And that's fun. But at the same time, is that really news? Uh, telling, uh, telling the world that there's some, the General Convention is the place where, do you remember those kids in the model you went in high school? Oh, mm -hmm. sure. Geeky, yeah. geeky people. Well, they've grown up, and they're now at the General Convention. Of the they Church. are. <laughs> they're, they're, they think that they can remake the world yes. by passing resolutions against global warming. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves what really of meat or substance is going to be there. And we have to ask ourselves about GAFCON. You know, just flying halfway around the world for a pep rally, if that's all it's going to be, we don't need wall-to-wall -wall coverage from a team of three professionals and hangers-on. 
Uh, Which is true, especially if they're going to live stream it. I don't know. You know, we're talking about the situation where uh, they may live stream, and you don't need Kevin if they're live streaming it. Uh, which is cool. I eventually want one day just to have uh, all Anglican TV operations in studio uh, where uh, events around the world tape themselves and send me the video. Well, what else? But the, the thing that we can think of, though, about GAFCON is Justin Welby has passed the tipping point of his archiepiscopacy. Yes. The George Bell affair, as Gavin and you have adequately covered, have covered it in great detail has caused the liberals to break with Welby as, and the conservatives to break with Welby. And we're now seeing defections. In the House of Lords, there was a debate over George Bell and the Bishop of Peterborough, Donald Allister, came out against Welby. And we're going to have a general synod of the Church of England, and this whole Bell thing is going to be brought up. And Welby's Welbyism is to hold everybody together and smother uh, differences in a fog of doublespeak. Is the Church of England going to break apart? And if that happens, Gafka will be one of the places because then all of a sudden these English bishops are going to show and make protestations that they are of the true faith. Welby might show, he might not show to prevent... Uh, in other words, we could... This could be where the action is. But if you ask me today, can we guarantee that? No, we can't. <laughs> no, can't. Well, maybe you can, because Justin is not doing anything to save face with the George Bell affair. Um, every time he has an opportunity just to, you know, well, maybe I didn't mean it as harsh as I meant it, he doesn't back down at all. And that's going to kill him because the liberals in the Church of England are now mad at Justin Welby. And Martin Percy, the dean of Oxford, who's, who is as liberal as they come, uh, is one of the leaders of the George Bell group trying to get the Archbishop of Canterbury to climb down. In other words, it's not just Gavin Ashenden and uh, conservatives who are throwing darts at Justin Wilby. It's across the board. Um, there's a play by uh, called The Winslow Boy, which, uh, oh, I forget the name of the author, but it was a very famous affair in England at the turn of the last century where a 12-year-old boy was accused of theft <laughs> Well, Keep going. Somebody's delivering something to the front door, and the dog was so kind enough to let us know. Well, the Winslow, Winslow boy was a real event that was made into a play where a little boy is turfed out, turfed out of the Navy as a midshipman for theft, and he was innocent, and a, a lawyer and, the, and a politician went to bat, and it went all the way to Parliament, where on the floor of Parliament, the question was raised, is the truth more important than the uh, reputation of the Royal Navy for never making a mistake? And the, Winslow, the point of the Winslow boy was uh, that truth will out, and that England must follow the truth no matter where it leads. And this play really resonates with me and Justin Welby, of uh, Justin Welby acting uh, immorally yeah. uh, to preserve the status quo and power when he's presented with truth. Oh, well, you know what to say about pride. George, I want to thank you from, uh, for leaving your sick bed and your antibiotics and coming out of the show this week. And uh, clearly it was a lot of fun. And uh, do keep us all in your prayers, especially Jill and George, as they uh, recover from the illnesses. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and no, I'm not suffering from radiation exposure. I am really this color. And you've been watching episode 364 of Anglican Unscripted.